In this video, I'm gonna show you exactly how I go from a script to a full finished video. And this is part of a series I'm doing where I go through the videos on my second channel and I break them down scene by scene and talk about some different things that I was thinking when I was writing the script and how that translated to actually making the video. And I think breaking down videos in this way gives you a lot of insight into how a video is crafted from the story and scripting portion to what you actually do when you're out filming. Personally, I've moved away from the vlog style where I just pick up my camera and press record and just shoot whatever happens. I like to have a thought out story and then add some vlog elements to that. So I call these vlogumentaries because they have the elements of a documentary style video or like an explainer style video, but then they have this action of actually going and doing something that feels more like a vlog. So it's this kind of mix and this cross between the vlog and the documentary world. And I think these are the kind of videos that are more of the future of YouTube. I think vlogs are great for a certain type of creator and different communities, but overall having this approach where you have more of a story and it's thought through before you go out and film is gonna make videos more interesting to watch and depending on the niche that you're in, it might have a much bigger impact and more of a broad appeal if you can bake in story structure and actually make something with a story so that your viewers don't get bored just watching you go about whatever it is that you're doing. So the niche that my second channel in is more the adventure travel style of content. So all of my videos are catered around exploring different parts in the world and then telling a story about that. So whether it's a strange phenomenon or a part of history that centers around the place that I've gone to. Now, if you wanna see the videos on my second channel, I'll make sure to include a link down in the description. The channel is called Project Discover Earth and you can go explore some different stories and that channel has no tutorials, no reviews, nothing like this that I have on this channel, it's completely different, it's all stories. How this video is gonna flow is that we're gonna read a section of the script, I'll give you some thoughts around what I was thinking when I was writing it, and then I'm gonna show you what I actually shot when I was out filming. So this is a story about Fort McGilvery up in Alaska. I flew up to Alaska to go explore this abandoned military base and I wanted to tell the history of World War II in Alaska. So the script format that I'm using is this dual column format. If you've seen other videos in this series, I've just been using my notes pad and just making notes and that's how I've been writing my scripts. I've changed over to using this dual column strategy because when you use this style of script, the left hand side is your dialogue, your voiceover, notes on anything for the story or what you're gonna say when you're out filming. And then the right hand side is all your visuals. So you can actually make notes of things that you wanna capture for specific parts of the script. This format works super well for shooting this kind of documentary, vlogumentary style. All right, so the first part is, it says TBD. So when I initially wrote this script, this intro, I didn't have written. I figured I would write it when I got done and I was sitting in the edit. So I actually wrote this section later after I was done filming. So it goes, miles away from any town is an abandoned structure that's slowly being swallowed by nature. This is Fort McGilvery. And during World War II, this was a strategic location during what many say is the Forgotten War. And this is when Japanese invaded a set of islands off the coast of Alaska as their first step to make their way to the mainland. So my visual that I had for this section was jump cuts traveling to the base, exploring the base, and I need an ending hook that sets up the fact that we're in a remote location, intercut with archival footage of the war that matches where we're going. So that's what I have for the hook of this video. Miles away from any town deep in the Alaskan wilderness is an abandoned structure that is slowly being swallowed by nature. This is Fort McGilvery, and during World War II, this was a strategic location during what many say is the Forgotten War. This is when the Japanese invaded a set of islands just off the coast of Alaska as their first step to make their way to the mainland of the United States. All right, so now I wanna get into the context of the story and break down kind of where we're at to set the scene. So the next section goes like this. How pretty is this? I flew up to Alaska to meet up with my buddy Jake Sloan, who is a local here, and we're on our way to find Fort McGilvery, which was one of the major defensive positions to safeguard the whole region during World War II. Unknown to most people, this remote location had a huge impact on the war. And then I have a italicized note, which is being overtaken by nature and get a chance to see it before it's gone. 
So I kind of just wrote that in there to see if I wanted to add that when I was out filming and talk about the fact that nature is kind of taking over this location. So my notes for myself that I wrote was on dock looking around, getting to the dock. So I was anticipating us going to like a marina and then we were gonna be getting into a boat or we we're gonna be getting into the kayaks. As you'll see, things changed on set, but it's the same concept, us getting to the water. Got it? How incredible is this? This is Resurrection Bay. I just flew up to Alaska to meet up with my buddy Jake Sloan, who's a local up here, and we're headed out to Fort McGilvery. And this was a important defensive position during World War II. And unknown to a lot of people, the battles that took place up here actually had a major impact on the outcome of the war. So this kind of sets the scene of where we're at and what we're about to do, but we still need a little bit more context of what was going on during World War II. This is kind of setting up all the backstory so that we can get into the actual action of getting to the space and going on the journey. So the next section I wrote down goes like this. The bombing of Pearl Harbor brought us into World War II, but there was another attack on US soil that happened in Alaska six months later. The Aleutian Islands are where the forgotten battles were fought, and most don't know about this campaign. It was also at a time where the Marines and and the soldiers were pushing onto the beaches of the Battle of Guanacano, which was the first major land offensive by the Allied forces against the Empire of Japan. However, these sporadic fights up here in Alaska were instrumental to an Allied victory in the Pacific. And then for my visuals, what I wrote down is, as we're loading up in the morning, use visuals from the war, if any. So I was thinking of using more archival footage for this and thinking that more of the process of us getting into the water and going. Now, as I read this, I realized that I did change the script. It's good to see kind of how things shift when you go from the script versus what you actually do when you're out filming. So here's this section. The bombing of Pearl Harbor brought us into World War II, but there was actually another attack on U.S. soil that happened here in Alaska six months later. Out in the Aleutian Islands is where the forgotten battles were fought, and it's here where the Japanese attacked Dutch Harbor as a stepping stone to get towards the U.S. mainland. And however small these battles were in the Aleutian Islands compared to the rest of the war, this campaign became instrumental to an Allied victory in the Pacific. So now we're gonna deviate from the script a little bit because when I'm making these videos, I do wanna have this aspect of experience in there. I don't just wanna read from a script for everything. I have done that in some videos, but I do like the ability to have some more vlog elements and give perspective of actually being there in the moment. I think it makes it more engaging for the viewer and does give it this more personal touch when you add these elements of yourself into the video. So let's watch this next section, which is just something I added. So I haven't really been kayaking in a while. Last time was probably about three years ago. I was in Portugal doing some sea kayaking. So a little tippy, but getting used to it. These views are insane. I mean, look at all these snow-capped mountains around us. It's the middle of summer. And where we're headed is, you can see straight out there, point at which where this base was built. All right, so now we're getting back towards the script. Next section goes like this. I'm not in the Aleutian Islands right now. Those are a chain of islands that extends away from Alaska and is a bridge to the East Asia. However, the fighting there is what caused the military to build the base that we're headed to right now. Fort McGilvery seems like it's built in the middle of nowhere, but this location is very strategic. What we have to do is first kayak to North Beach, and then from there we'll travel through the dense Alaskan forest to find the fort. So this is what I wrote down, but when we are out filming, we didn't make it to North Beach because the waves got so bad. So things will happen when you're out filming and you're gonna have to adjust and actually adjust the story to fit what is going on. This is just a guide. If you're writing a script like this, you don't have to stick to the script. It is good to have the script to fall back on, but what I've found is that when I'm out filming, I'll just use this and then if depending on the situation that I'm in, I'll just change it and make it fit because I have the story here. All I need to do is get through the story, but fill the story in with whatever the situation is that we're actually in. So here's this next section. To get to Fort McGilvery, we have a five mile kayak across the bay. And then from there, it's roughly a four mile hike to get to the base. Now, we're not in the Aleutian Islands. Those are out tail end of Alaska and they extend all the way to the east, Asia. But 
the battles that took place out on those islands is what prompted building the base that we're heading out to right now. Now looking at the script, I'm realizing that I switched a lot of things around because of the situation that we got ourselves in. So we had to stop a little bit early. As you can see, a lot of this was set up, if you look at my visuals, I was gonna try to land on North Beach, go to the old dock before heading on the trail. So it was very planned out to like get to North Beach, jump on the trail and go. Very clean, like that's what we were planning on doing. But we had to add this additional hike to get up and over. And so I used this as an opportunity to jump ahead in the script and talk more about the war. So here's this section of the script. Six months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1942, the Japanese launched a two day attack on Dutch Harbor, which was on one of the Aleutian Islands. There their targets were the naval operating base and the U.S. Army Fort. This attack was an attempt to establish a foothold in the Northern Pacific. From here, the Japanese could advance towards either Alaskan mainland or move towards the northwestern states of the U.S. A few days after this attack, the Japanese invaded and annexed Alaska, the Alaskan islands of Kishka and Attu, which are the most western Aleutian islands. Now, there wasn't just a military base here on these islands. The Aleut people have lived in this region for thousands of years. After invading Attu, Japanese forces took the native islands Islanders to Japan as prisoners. With the supposed goal of protecting the Aleut people, the American military forced nearly 900 villagers to move from their homes in the Aleutian Islands to southeast Alaska, and the military burned their villages to prevent the Japanese from finding any resources that might aid in their advances. So essentially they cleared the islands and made it a battleground. Alright, so now let's look at this section. In 1942, the Japanese launched a two-day attack on Dutch Harbor. This attack was an attempt to establish a foothold in the Northern Pacific. And from here, the Japanese could advance either towards Alaskan mainland or move towards the Northwestern states in the US. And a few days after this attack, the Japanese took the islands of Kishka and Attu, which were the most Western Aleutian islands. Now there wasn't just military bases here on these islands. The Aleut people have lived in this region for thousands of years. But after invading Attu, the Japanese forces took the native islanders to Japan as prisoners. And so with the supposed goal of protecting the Aleut people, the American military forced nearly 900 villagers to move from their homes in the Aleutian Islands to Southeast Alaska. And the allied military burned their villages to prevent the Japanese from finding any resources that might aid in their advances. So essentially they cleared these islands to make it a battleground. Now the next section, I'm hiking through the forest trying to get to North Beach. So I bounced back in the script. And so when I was out filming, I was moving these blocks around and thinking through how I could actually do some of this in voiceover with some different visuals. And so that's why things kind of shift from the script to what actually happened. So the next section goes like this. Fort McGilvery seems like it's built in the middle of nowhere, but this location is very strategic. What we have to do first is kayak to North Beach, blah, blah, blah. I changed this a little bit. Resurrection Bay is south of Seward, Alaska, which was the terminus for the Alaskan Railroad, which during the war served as an important route for transporting civilian and military supplies throughout the entire territory. If Seward was taken by the enemy, then the military would be cut off. All right, so now let's take a look at this section. Fort McGilvery is definitely out in the middle of nowhere. We just kayaked five miles across Resurrection Bay to Cape Canes, which is where the base sits. And this was actually a very strategic location because at the end of Resurrection Bay was the town of Seward, which was the terminus of the Alaskan Railroad, which if that got cut off and taken by enemy forces, well, all military and civilian supplies would have been cut off for the entire region. Now this next section where I talk about Derby Cove, this was all just ad-libbed out there when I was filming because this was the reality of the situation that we got into versus what we had planned. So we landed at what's called Derby Cove, and that actually wasn't where we intended to land. We were trying to get to North Beach, which is where the main dock was for this whole military base. But the waves were getting pretty rough out there, so we decided to stop here, and we're gonna hike up and over, get to North Beach, and that's where we'll start seeing the remnants of this military base. So this next section wasn't written down. This again, it was just kind of in the moment, just recreating the script in my head for the kind of situation that we got ourselves into. So I have a note here in my script. I said throughout this region, there's over five miles of roads that were built. And there was some more information that I have about you know no roads connecting Seward. So I just started ad-libbing based on where we we're at and where I was at in the story. And so this next section kind of just goes through that as we get into the hike. This was the spot where 
boats would come in for the base. You can see the old pier over there. We're not super far from Seward, however, no roads were built between Seward and the military base. So everything had to be brought in by boat and came to this beach. From this beach here, there was five miles of road built all through this area. So here's this next section, this is what I wrote down. We've made it to Kane's Cape. This location was selected for the base for a few reasons. The Cape gives a good vantage point to defend anyone coming into Resurrection Bay, and it also stays ice-free during the winter. But that doesn't mean that the winters here are mild. So now we're getting back to my original script, landed on North Beach, gonna do this section, and then we're gonna start hiking and get into the military base. So this location was chosen for a few reasons. One is that we're on a cape that sticks out into Resurrection Bay. And this allowed it to be a perfect vantage point to see oncoming enemies that were coming in to attack Seward. But the second reason was that this area stays ice-free in the winter. Alaska has harsh winters, and having a port that stayed ice-free made it so that it was strategically important for this entire region during the war. Now we're actually getting into exploring this space. So for me, this was just come up with whatever happens when I'm there. So this is more of that vlog element where you just kind of explore as it's happening and film yourself going through the process. This is kind of the part where you just put your personality into it. So this path that we're hiking, this was the old road that goes from North Beach all the way to the base. How cool is this? This is the old ammo storage. It was just built into the rock. Amazing how nature is just taking over though. From back here, you can't even see what this is. Come back around to the front, there it is. And look at this door, just steel and concrete. If this was anywhere else, this would be graffitied, just destroyed, but we're so far out here. So I was out with my buddy Jake Sloan on this adventure and he's actually been to the space multiple times. So as we were talking, I made sure to get some of his conversation on camera so that he could talk about his experience and you know, get us away from just being a scripted piece. Interviews in your videos is gonna be a huge advantage to making it feel just more dynamic. So if there's moments where you can grab an interview from someone that knows about the location or someone that you meet or just something that happens, it's just gonna add another layer to your videos. I've been coming out here since pretty much the first year we moved to Alaska, which was in 1996. And in back in the 90s when I came out here, like uh, most of these spruce trees were around, but they were a lot smaller. They were maybe like 12 feet high, but almost none of this brush was around. Because this was used to spot potential incoming attack, you could see all the way out over the ocean. And now you really can't see very far at all, just because the brush has overgrown so much in the last 20 or 30 years. I can see why this was such a strategic point for the military because from here, if there was no trees, you could see everyone that would be coming into this bay. You just have such a good view of everything that could be headed towards Seward. So this is me just reacting to the story a little bit. So this was a strategic point. Now that I'm there and exploring, I get to give my perspective of what I feel when I'm in that moment. You wanna make sure that you're giving your reaction to whatever's happening. So I have this section here that I included when I was talking about the gun turrets. And it goes, this base wasn't here for long. By March of 1944, the military ordered the fort to be dismantled. The guns were dismantled and shipped off to locations in South Dakota and San Diego, and the buildings were abandoned. Let's see what I did. So this was one of the old gun turrets. Look how big this is. They used to have a massive gun mounted here. You had a perfect view. Now there's two of these here on the base, one here and one on the other side. And they were placed in a way where they could see out two different directions over the bay. Now, Fort McGilvery wasn't here long. By March of 1944, the military ordered this base to be dismantled. These guns that were on either side of the base were shipped off to South Dakota and San Diego. And this entire base was just abandoned. 
So the first half of that, I ad-libbed a little bit. And that's because when I was researching, I obviously learned a lot about this whole story. And so there's different things that as you're researching a topic, you can just interject because you're gonna remember it when you're out filming. So all this information about the gun turrets, I didn't actually write into my script, but because I've been researching the story, I knew these different elements that I didn't necessarily write in the script. And so it just felt like a natural time to talk about the guns there and it fit perfectly with what I was doing. And so this next section, we're gonna go in and actually explore the abandoned battery, which is pretty cool. Now, I don't have anything really written for that as well, but I do have this section about kind of what was going on in the war. And so this is where I ad-libbed a little bit and then I took from this section. So this is what I wrote. The reason for this was because the victories in the Aleutian Islands. The Japanese held Kiska and Attu, but on May 11, 1943, US and Canadian soldiers landed on Attu to take it back. The Japanese dug in and booby-trapped much of the surrounding island. The Americans suffered 3,929 casualties, but the Japanese were overrun. In a last-ditch effort, the Japanese committed the single largest Bonanzi charge, an attack in which every infantryman first accepted their death before charging into battle in all of the Pacific Campaign. The Japanese suffered 2,351 deaths, with hundreds more believed to have been lost in the unforgiving weather. In the end, America would retake the islands and force the Japanese Navy back, and the only route to the continental U.S. was secure once again. So when I was out filming, I remember this was a pretty hard section for me to get out. So this was kind of a mishmash of getting to this main base and then kind of explaining why these guns were dismantled so quickly after they were built. So this is the fort's main battery. When you go through here and you pop out on either side, that's where the six inch guns are. So the Japanese held the islands of Kishka and Attu, but on May 11th of 1943, the US and Canadian military landed on the island of Attu to take it back. But it wasn't an easy battle. The Japanese dug themselves in and put up a strong fight. The US suffered over 3,000 casualties, but eventually the Japanese were overrun. And in a last ditch effort, the Japanese accepted the fact that they were all gonna die and they all charged into battle. So you can imagine how intense that fighting was. So in the end, the Allies retook the islands and forced the Japanese back. And the only route to the continental US was secure once again. So this base was no longer needed. So I actually did that section talking directly to camera, but I felt it made much more sense to explore the base and then just have that as voiceover because if I was to do the talk on camera, just like in the forest talking about the story and then go explore the base for another few minutes, well, it really slowed down the pace of this video. And when I'm making these videos, I wanna keep things moving and keep things going forward. So I try to find ways to combine different elements to keep the story moving while still getting in all of the different things that I wanted to when I was out filming. So I went more the route of this abandoned place is just an element of the story and just putting ourselves there as if we were a soldier walking around these halls and kind of exploring. So for the end of the script, I just need to tie this up in a bow. So what was the result of this war? What came out of it and who was affected? That's kind of where I was going with this last section. With the victory on these islands, the Allies captured the Japanese fighter aircraft called Zero. It was a single seat, low wing monoplane that was used heavily during the war. American technicians studied and reverse engineered the plane, which allowed them to successfully determine the weak points and vulnerabilities of the fighter aircraft. This information proved vital in later battles. So here's what I got for this section. Now with the victory out on the Aleutian Islands, the Americans were able to capture a plane that the Japanese used heavily during the war called a Zero. It was a single seat, low wing monoplane that was used heavily during the war. And American technicians were able to reverse engineer the plane and be able to find all of its weak points and vulnerabilities. And this information became essential later on in the war. So that one was pretty close. And then I go into this. Unfortunately, the Aleut people spent years living in makeshift camps in the southeast Alaska after the Aleutian campaign was over. And some were able to return, however, there were some villages that remained off limits. So this is how this section goes. Now while all this was going on, the Aleut people stayed in makeshift camps in southeast Alaska. And when the campaign was over, they were able to return home. But unfortunately, some of the islands remained off limits indefinitely. 
So now we get to the last paragraph of the script. So you need some sort of resolution for this video. We kind of told the resolution of the story of World War II and this base, but now we need to have something that the audience can take away. I always like to add this in the videos because it just adds that little extra that connects you with your audience who's watching the video. So here's what I wrote for my ending. This was one of the most well-preserved bases that I've been able to explore, and it's an extraordinary feat of engineering, especially being out here. Often these places get destroyed after they're abandoned, but because this one is so remote, it will continue to be here until nature swallows it up. Exploring Fort McGilvery allows us to experience World War II from a soldier's perspective, but this is a story that also shows us how much war can have an impact on a region, even one as remote as this. And my visuals was back to the boat. So this is the last scene. We're getting in the water, getting ready to head back home. And this was kind of the big takeaway. This is one of the most well-preserved abandoned places that I've been able to explore. And it was a pretty incredible feat of engineering. Often these places just get destroyed from people coming and graffiti and garbage and partying. And, but this one, because it's in such a remote location, it's basically just being taken apart by nature itself. And the structures that are surviving will be here for a long time. Exploring Fort McGilvery allows us to get a sense of what it was like being here during World War II and, and seeing what the soldiers saw from this location. And this story also shows us how much impact war has on a region, even when it is somewhere super remote. And so that wraps up the video. Now, to write this script, I basically pulled a lot of different information from sites I found around the war. I typically start somewhere like Wikipedia just to get some main elements of like, this happened and this happened and this happened, so it gives me some jumping off points. And then I'll find different resources online and just look through some different articles and find some different things that really tie the whole story together. I pulled all of this information offline, and so I use that time when I'm going from Southern California to Seattle and then from Seattle to Alaska to write the script in the plane. Now beyond that, when I got home, I used this script to help create my first cut. I sat here in my studio, did some voiceover work. I have like a little voiceover booth over here that I use and I was able to edit this video in about one day, which for some of you might seem crazy putting all these elements together, but having a script gives you a nice runway to put all the pieces together. And then it's just adding on all the additional elements like the historical footage and the sound effects and the music, which if you have a library built up of all of these elements, and then as you're researching, you're pulling some historical stuff for a story like this, well, it makes the whole process so much easier. Now, if you wanna see another video that breaks down how I actually shot this video using a 360 60 camera, well make sure you check out this video right here. It goes through all the filming techniques that I used when I was out shooting this video. I'll see you over there.